Um, thank you for coming. And I'm going to, to speak this evening about community. And in the spirit, I'd like to use this occasion to remember a friend and a Conradian mentor, Jacques Bertou, who passed away recently. So I'd like us to remember him. Okay, I'm, I'm talking about Conrad, the amazing or an amazing bloody foreigner. And the legend is well known. Joseph Conrad was the Polish emigre who learned to speak English while serving as a sailor, and he rose to the rank of captain in the British Merchant Service before leaving the sea in 1895 to become one of the country's most celebrated authors. So celebrated, as Philip said, that when F.R. Liebes identified the great tradition of the English novel, he included Conrad alongside Jane Austen, George Eliot, Charles Dickens, Henry James, and D.H. Lawrence. This too is part of the legend, because Conrad, as everybody knows, was writing in his third language, after Polish and French. Conrad was naturalized as a British subject in 1886, at the age of 28, just before passing his certificate for his master's, or the examination for his master's certificate. This meant that well over half of his life was spent as a British subject. Conrad's engagement with his adopted homeland was professional. He was a professional twice over. He was a professional sailor, and he was a professional writer. And professionalism, by definition, is exclusive. Citizen, uh, citizen, um, I'll get there in a moment. Citizenship, <laughs> by contrast. <laughs> so, um, citizenship, I'm arguing, is inclusive. From citizenship, we get um, the sense of interiority. Marlowe's claim that Lord Jim is one of us. So Conrad engages with England, he becomes a citizen, and yet in Virginia Woolf's fine obituary, published in the Times Literary Supplement, she begins, our guest has left us. At what point, if any, does the outsider become an insider? When and how does one join the club? With a problematically dual national identity, Conrad lived out the modern condition of alienation, while his writings reflected its philosophy. Writing to a fellow countryman in 1903, I kind of feel I've got a wand. Um, this is a sort of geriatric Harry Potter. I'll be telling you some different things we go along. Conrad said that both at sea and on land, my point of view is English, from which the conclusion should not be drawn that I have become an Englishman. That is not the case. Homo duplex has, in my case, more than one meaning. How Conrad engaged with England and Englishness and transformed himself in the process provides my subject this evening. And that issue is the difficult process of adopting and being adopted by a homeland and the attendant codes of inclusion and exclusion that confer belonging. I'm going to be using the terms England and Britain interchangeably as they were used during the period. For instance, in 1881, Sir John Seeley told his students at Cambridge that the empire was a vast English nation. And the term Angleterre was used by Proust and most French people at the time as a general term to cover Britain and even Ireland. Right, with that out of the way, let's turn to Conrad's beginnings. It's always quite fun talking about Conrad. I get the feeling I'm talking about someone who pays the bills in our house. <laughs> when we turn to Conrad, we discover that nothing's quite what it seems. And the first thing to say about Joseph Conrad is that his name wasn't Joseph Conrad. <laughs> he was born Josef Conrad Theodor Korzeniowski. And he was born in December 1857. He never officially changed his name to Joseph Conrad, the anglicized form by which his adopted homeland, and the wider world would come to know him. Let's start with death. 
He's buried in Canterbury Cemetery, where, bearing his transnational identity, the name on his tombstone is a combination of the anglicized and Polish forms, with one of its terms, Theodore, misspelt. The second thing to note is that technically he wasn't Polish. Conrad's birthplace, Berdychev, is in Podolia, a part of the Polish Commonwealth appropriated into the Russian Ukraine in 1793. The Polish Republic would only be restored in 1918 after the First World War. So while Conrad was certainly born into a Polish heritage, and his parents, Apollo and Ava, would sacrifice themselves and Conrad's early years to the cause of Polish nationalism, and to resisting imperialist, imperialist Russia, his Poland was a Poland of the heart, a homeland of the heart, rather than a geographical fact. So strictly speaking, he was born a citizen of the imperial Russian Empire. Conrad spoke of having two lives, and so to place him in his time, I shall take as my cue Bob Dylan's injunction, you just didn't think you were going to get away with that, <laughs> <laughs> to take what you have gathered from coincidence. And I'm going to consider the coincidence of two years. 1857, the year of his birth, and 1895, the year in which he published his first novel. And as we shall see, the contours of Joseph Conrad's life are designed, or seem designed, to shape our response to his art, and to his engagement with England. So 1857, and to orient ourselves, this is the year of Little Dorrit, it's the year of Barchester Towers, and the year of, of Tom Brown's school days. On the continent, it's the year of Baudelaire's Les Fleurs du Mal. But Conrad's birth year, 1857, links him, through historical coincidence, to the great national fact of the age, the British Empire. He shares the year of his birth with Sir Edward Elgar, whose music captured and contributed towards the popular patriotic mood in such well-known pieces as Imperial March, 1897, the Coronation March, 1901, and Empire March, 1924, coincidentally the year of Conrad's death. Also in 1857, in his Cambridge University address, David Livingston urged, I go back to Africa to try to make an open path for commerce and Christianity. Carry out the work which I have begun. I leave it with you. This was the year in which the British explorers Richard Burton and John Speak discovered Lake Tanganyika. The following year, Speak found Lake Victoria. Recalling his boyhood and his education, Conrad wrote, I stand here confessed as a contemporary of the Great Lakes. 1857 is also the year of the Indian Mutiny, sometimes regarded as the first step towards the United Independence Movement in India. The challenge posed to imperial rule was slight, but like the, the Crimean War just before it and the two Boer Wars later in the century, it was part of the gradual disenchantment with empire, part of the challenge to any lingering complacency in the existing order. So Elgar's music certainly celebrated Englishness, but did so in an era when empire, the empire that provides so much of its definition, was under threat. Perhaps inevitably it was when Britain's global and industrial supremacy was waning that the expression of Englishness was at its most strident. Conrad described himself as the spoiled, adopted child of Great Britain, and even of empire. But even as he was engaging with Great Britain, its relationship with Greater Britain was in the process of revision. In 1891, the poet of empire, Rudyard Kipling, could ask, and what should they know of England, who only England know? A decade later, G.K. Chesterton reformulated this to ask an alternative question. What can they know of England who know only the world? So Conrad espouses his new national identity at a moment when the sense of Englishness was itself being reformulated. 
So where does Conrad fit into empire? Just before he turned 17, Conrad made what he would describe as a standing jump out of my racial surroundings and associations. He traveled by train to Marseille, securing work for a firm of ship owners, and his sea life began with three trips for the firm to the West Indies, each lasting about six months. After which, he jumped ship, as it were, and joined a British vessel, thus beginning his 20 years in the British Merchant Service. In a splendid piece of self-mythologizing, Conrad describes this transformative moment in his life. He's working as a water clerk in Marseille Harbour, ferrying a captain back to his ship, and his dinghy sails close to the ship's side. A few strokes brought us alongside, and it was then that for the very first time in my life, I heard myself addressed in English. The speech of my secret choice, of my future, of long friendships, of the deepest affections, of hours of toil and hours of ease, and of solitary hours too, of books read, of thoughts pursued, of remembered emotions, of my very dreams. And if, after being thus fashioned by it, in that part of me which cannot decay, I dare not claim it aloud as my own, then, at any rate, the speech of my children. The actual words addressed to Conrad, the words that inspire us, are nothing if not demotic, simply look out there. And yet they have the force of an epiphany, reminding us that one of the hallmarks of Conrad's writing is his capacity to transmute prosaic reality into art. The simple act of pushing against the ship to propel the dinghy away is rendered in sensuous, even sexual terms. And when I bore against the smooth flank of the first English ship I ever touched in my life, I felt it already throbbing under my open palm. Eat your heart out and summers. <laughs> <laughs> Memorably describing himself as a Polish nobleman cased in British tar, Conrad spent nearly 20 years as a sailor in, the Brit in British ships in the overseas trade at a time when Britain dominated the world shipping and owned nearly half of it. This had practical implications for the composition of crews because the national supply of sailors was unable to meet demand, so one third of the sailors in the British Merchant Marine were foreign, so they were like Conrad. The other side of this is that by the end of the century, Britain was dependent upon imports for two thirds of her food. By this point, Britain was imperial because she had to be. As Eric Hobsbawm puts it, access to the non-European world was simply a matter of life and death for the British economy. Historically, too, Conrad saw the world from the decks of British merchant ships at a moment when Britain's maritime dominance was under threat from, in particular, the United States of America, resurgent after the economic effects of the Civil War, and from Germany. Conrad's professional connection with the marine life of the nation continued after he left the sea, after he signed off on his last ship in 1894. In the years that followed, he lent his expert opinion to debates in the popular press, on the Titanic, for instance, or he visited North Sea defense installations at the invitation of the Royal Navy during the First World War. But it's Conrad's contribution to our literature that concerns me here. He turned from traveling in and trading with the colonial world to writing about it at a moment when the popular taste was for exotic fiction, was fed by the likes of H. Ryder Haggard, whose King Solomon's Mines was declared the most amazing story ever written. <laughs> so we turn to 1895, Conrad's beginnings as a writer. And in 1895, he published his first novel, Or Meyer's Folly, followed a year later by An Outcast of the Islands. Recognition was immediate 
H.G. Wells, then at the peak of his fictional powers, declared an outcast of the islands, perhaps the finest piece of fiction published this year, as Almayer's Folly was the finest that was published in 1895. With symmetrical elegance, Conrad's career as a published author begins in the year that Thomas Hardy's ends with his last novel, Jude the Obscure. By serendipity, there is the sense of a torch passing from one literary master to the next. Also publishing fiction in 1895 were the likes of George Gissing, Ryder Haggard, Henry James, Rudyard Kipling, George Meredith, and H.G. Wells published a volume of short stories and two novels, one of which, The Time Machine, in its parable of the effete, decadent Eloy, dependent upon and yet at the mercy of and preyed upon by the dark subterranean Morlocks, linked the late 19th century anxieties of degeneration and class. This was an era in which British political life mirrored the changing configurations and realignments of national identity. The need for an increasingly unionized working class to be represented in the House of Commons led to the formation of the Independent Labour Party in 1893. The campaign for women's votes politicized gender in the pursuit of a revised concept of British citizenship. The term feminism came into use in the 1890s. Conrad also arrived in the middle of the so-called Yellow 90s, the years of the decadent movement. These were the years of Aubrey Beardsley and, of course, Oscar Wilde, whose trial took place in 1895, also the year in which Freud published his first work on psychoanalysis. Internationally, the world of Greater Britain was also unsettled. 1895 ended with the ill-fated Jameson Raid in South Africa, this pro-British attempt to overthrow the Boer government of President Kruger was easily repulsed. It's remembered chiefly because Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany sent a telegram congratulating Paul Kruger, thus declaring Germany's imperial interests. Kipling called the Jameson Raid the first battle in the War of 1418, a little before its time, but necessary to clear the ground. None of this dimmed the pageantry or curbed the celebrations for Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee in 1897. In her diary, Beatrice Webb summarized the certainly social mood. Imperialism in the air, all classes drunk with sightseeing and hysterical loyalty. Conrad's imperial fictions, however, offered oppositional counterblasts to this mood of jingoism. The late 18th century, or the late 1890s, I beg your pardon, saw works like Karain, an outpost of progress, and one of his most brilliant and problematic works, Heart of Darkness. Typical of Conrad's colonial narratives, it is characterized by variable perspectives, shifting and competing points of view, ensuring that the tale stands at a point of intersection between the colonial and what we now think of as the post-colonial world. It is both of and transcending its historical moment. And I want to turn to Conrad, the sea writer. This is the Torrens, um, the ship that Conrad had a particular fondness for, in which he, in which he served. Um, in this Jubilee uh, year, in 1897, after two novels set in the Dutch East Indies, Conrad turned his attention to the sea in the novel The Nigger of the Narcissus. The fund of material at his disposal led Henry James to comment, no one has known for intellectual use the things you know. And you have, as the artist of the whole matter, an authority that no one has approached. The sea echoes through our national story. Nowhere in Britain is one ever more than 70 miles from the sea. To Auden, the sea is that state of barbaric vagueness and disorder out of which civilization emerged. And as the great American sailor historian Alfred Mann claimed, the English nation, more than any other, owed its greatness to the sea. The sea finds its visual expression in the work of England's greatest painter, 
J.M.W. Turner. And unsurprisingly, during the Age of Empire, the sea became a national obsession, finding one outlet in the celebrations to mark the centenary of Trafalgar in 1905, to which Conrad contributed an essay on Nelson. The other arts, too, responded to this national obsession. Musically, this is the period of Elgar's sea pictures and Vaughan Williams's sea symphony. Henry Wood's fantasia of British sea songs with Rule Britannia as its stirring conclusion, and now the customary finale to The Last Night of the Proms was first performed in 1905 as part of the Trafalgar celebrations. The period's literature boasts Kipling, The Seven Seas, Newbolt, Admiral's Hall, and John Maysfield's Seawater or Saltwater Ballads. And into this moment steps Conrad the author, quickly to become our greatest sea writer. I don't know what that is, but hang in there. <laughs> in the second half, I play electric music for those who are <laughs> An early review in the New York Times said, Mr. Conrad, like Britannia, rules the waves. However much he balked at being typecast as a sea writer, works like Youth, The Nigger of the Narcissus, and Typhoon not only identify the nation's mood, they also help to compose the national mythology of the sea. Conrad's first... See if you just wait long enough, someone will do it for you. <laughs> of him as a sea writer, he was immediately appropriated. His writings about the sea were, were taken into the nation's myth kitty. Early reviewers found in youth, for instance, both the lyric note of the sagas and a modern English epic of the sea. The Nigger of the Narcissus, published in 1897, is Conrad's first English novel. It charts the voyage of the sailing ship Narcissus, home to England. And at the end of the journey, England herself is mythopoetically transformed, transformed into a great ship. A great ship. For ages had the ocean battered in vain her enduring sides. She was there when the world was vaster and darker, when the sea was great and mysterious and ready to surrender the prize of fame to audacious men a ship mother of fleets and nations, the great flagship of the race, stronger than the storms and anchored in the open sea. And we shouldn't be surprised that it took an outsider to become our great fabulist of the sea. It was, after all, another foreigner, Nicholas Pevsner, who opened English eyes to their own architectural traditions. Pevsner's outsiderness, too, was noted and chided, as witness John Betjeman's public spat with the person that he called the Herr Professor Doctor. <laughs> and Conrad clearly believed that his writings reflected the national impulse. My expression, such as it is, has as its source, or has its source in English sentiment and none other. On this fact, and on the consciousness of any originality, I base my hope of ultimate hearing from the public. No one can enter my field through my gate and work it in my way. But when you look at it without prejudice, the field is an English field, after all. And when the critic Robert Lund described Conrad as without either country or language, <laughs> Conrad responded, I thought that a man who has written The Nigger of the Narcissus, Typhoon, The End of the Tether, Youth, was safe from that sort of thing. 
But while he enriched the literature of his adopted homeland, there was a price to pay. Back in Poland, he was accused by the novelist Elijah Orzeszkova of betrayal, of betraying his nation. Dante regarded the business of the poet as being to purify the dialect of the tribe. And in this sense, Conrad was no mean traitor. He was purifying the dialect of another tribe. Although he claimed to have had to work like a coal miner in his pit, quarrying all my English sentences out of a black night, he's now regarded as one of our great stylists. Indeed, he pronounced himself haunted, mercilessly haunted, by the necessity of style. And as one contemporary reviewer put it, Mr. Conrad's English gets into one's veins. Of his relationship with the English language, he wrote, English was for me neither a matter of choice nor adoption. The merest idea of choice had never entered my head. And as to adoption, well, yes, there was an adoption, but it was I who was adopted by the genius of the language, which, directly I came out of the stammering stage, made me its own, so completely that its very idioms, I truly believe, had a direct action on my temperament and fashioned my still plastic character. Aesthetically, Conrad recognized and responded to the metaphorical impulses that make literary language. Writing to a friend, explicitness is fatal to the glamour of all artistic work, robbing it of suggestiveness, destroying all illusion. Here we have Conrad describing the verbal expertise of another gifted creature, Mr. Kurtz in Heart of Darkness. The point was in his being a gifted creature, and that of all his gifts, the one that stood out preeminently, that carried with it a sense of real presence, was his ability to talk, his words, the gift of expression, the bewildering, the illuminating, the most exalted and most contemptible, the pulsating stream of light or the deceitful flow from the heart of an impenetrable darkness. The writing here is guided by metaphors that offer invitations to interpretation while never yielding a single meaning. In this matter, or in this manner, Conrad's style negotiates a correspondence, the correspondence between words and the world that they describe. But Conrad went, went further than this. He brought English literature into relationship with colonial literature, in particular through his intimate knowledge of the French masters like Flaubert and Maupassant. One measure of belonging to a literary community <coughs> is intertextuality. In Michael Riffeter's words, literariness is sought at the level where texts combine or signify by referring to other texts rather than to lesser science systems. In Conrad's pages, the English literary tradition is brought into dialogue with other literatures. The resulting hybrid form opens up new possibilities and gives new inflections to the English novel, and it also accounts for some of the perceived strangeness in Conrad's writings, leading more than one critic to conclude that the works read like translations. To take but one and perhaps rather obvious example of this, here is a moment from early on in The Nigger of the Narcissus involving two sailors who are new to the ship. All that happens is that one asks another for tobacco. Donkin changed his tone. Give us a bit of backy, mate, he breathed out confidentially. I haven't had a smoke or chew for the last month. I'm ramping mad for it. Come on, old man. Don't be familiar, said the nigger. Donkin started and sat down on a chest nearby out of sheer surprise. We haven't kept pigs together, <laughs> continued James Wade in a deep undertone. Here's your tobacco. <laughs> the moment synthesizes a range of conflicting historical and political themes. Donkin is a cockney whose first words in the novel include the claims, I am an Englishman, I am, and I stood up for my rights like a good one. His Cockney status, and Waite will later refer to him as East End Trash, 
does not prevent linguistic ventriloquism. The phrase old man sits oddly alongside dropped aspirates and colloquial speech habits. Donkin's colloquitor, James Waite, is, we learn later, a native of St. Kitts, one of the Leeward Islands in the West Indies, and then part of the British Empire. It is Waite who gives the novella its stark racist title. For all the talk of period usage, the term nigger was racially offensive at the time, and Waite responds to it as such within the novel. So although one would not guess it from their speech habits, this moment represents a meeting of colonizer and colonized. But what strikes one most when reading this exchange is that odd non-English put-down that associates familiarity with keeping pigs together. <laughs> I would have killed uh, keep water off with any of you. Um, <laughs> and we're right to find it strange because it's based on a Polish proverb. <coughs> So Conrad has turned to his first language to find an idiom required in his third. The fact that this is employed by a St. Kitts native only adds to the complex humor of the moment. This is further inflected when one adds that the Narcissus is about to sail home to England from Bombay Harbor. The year of publication of the novel is 1897, the year when Queen Victoria, Empress of India, celebrated her diamond jubilee with. And I want to stay with this novel just a bit longer. In the great storm scene later on, the Narcissus is turned onto her side. This is off the, co the, 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 the um, uh, coast of southern Africa. And the sailors are forced to cling to the decks in order to, to survive. Whilst doing so, they suddenly realize that James Waite is trapped in his cabin, presumably below the waterline. He's in a sick bay, since he's clearly dying, um, and he's trapped. So a small rescue party is assembled and sets off. They discover that in order to free weight, they're going to have to drop into a carpenter's room through the doorway and break through a wall to get into the adjoining cabin. It's dangerous. There's a mess of the carpenter's tools that have been thrown off of shelves as the ship has, has, has lurched. Once they get down, they discover the contents of the carpenter's store on what is now the floor, and they have to pick their way through this to get at the wall. And this is what they have to dig through. At the bottom, the nails lay in a layer several inches thick. It was ghastly. Every nail in the world, not driven in firmly somewhere, seemed to have found its way into that carpenter's shop. There they were, of all kinds, the remnants of stalls from seven voyages. Tin tacks, copper tacks, sharp as needles, <coughs> pump nails with big heads like tiny, mush tiny iron mushrooms, nails without any heads, horrible, French nails polished and slim. They lay in a solid mass, more inabordable than a hedgehog. <laughs> the odd word inabordable is French, meaning inaccessible. <laughs> <laughs> the point here, though, is this, this drop into the carpenter's shop is simultaneously a descent into the quotidian. Heroic rescue encounters prosaic reality. A feature of art is its capacity to find the extraordinary in the ordinary. As Baudelaire said of Delacroix's paintings, he captures the infinite in the finite. In one of his late great poems, entitled The Circus Animal's Desertion, W.B. Yeats traced the source of his inspiration to what he called the foul rag and bone shop of the heart. Here, the carpentry shop in a British merchant ship serves as a comparable, a comparable image of the humdrum source of Conradian inspiration. And the fact that its portrayal involves delving for a word in his second language only dramatizes the process. I keep going over here to check my notes. <coughs> By general agreement, Conrad's major literary achievement is the trilogy of novels that spans the Edwardian period, 
Nostromo, 1904, The Secret Agent, 1907, Under Western Eyes, 1911. Their combined subject matter is national and international politics. The Edwardian era, the years between the death of Queen Victoria and the outbreak of the First World War, is often regarded as a sunlit period of calm between the old and the new orders, personified and presided over by the genial, somewhat self-indulgent figure of Edward VII, wittily referred to as Edward the Caresser by Henry James. <laughs> Conrad's three political novels provide an ominous counterpoint to the period's optimism. His capacity to sustain a rigorously political focus at a moment when Western Europe teetered unknowingly on the edge of oblivion, led George Orwell to declare that Conrad possessed a sort of grown-upness and political understanding which would have been almost impossible to a native English writer at the time. To George Steiner, the skepticism often detected in Conrad's fiction, too, has a political edge. Steiner writes, almost alone among his contemporaries, he has seen through both the meliorist and civilizing promises of imperialism and technology and the utopian messianic illusions of socialism and communist revolution. It is precisely from this twofold disenchantment that springs his masterpieces. In The Secret Agent, Conrad's great London novel, inspired by the attempt to blow up the Greenwich Observatory in 1894, he turns from international to domestic politics to expose the inequalities in British society. The anarchists' bomb plot backfires, but it is replaced by something even more combustible, a society primed to explode. And even while the plot is concerned with the factual contemporary debate over whether Britain should provide a haven for those fleeing political oppression, the subplot is concerned with the vexed state of the nation. Even the simple-minded Stevie can see that it's a bad world for poor people. Edward Garnett began his review of the novel, It is good for us English to have Mr. Conrad in our midst, visualizing for us life, that we are, or life as we are constitutionally unable to perceive it. Conrad's most famous narrator, the sea captain, Marlowe is English, and he brings an English perspective to bear on his subject. When eulogizing that home, distant enough for all its hearthstones to be like one hearthstone in Lord Jim, home is England. Marlowe's status, though, as character narrator, means that he is both inside and outside his tale. According to John Galsworthy, Marlowe, though English in name, is not so in nature. For his part, Conrad was stunned by any reminder of his foreignness. The title of this talk stems from one such occasion when he responded exasperatedly to criticism of the secret agent. I have been so cried up of late as a sort of freak, an amazing bloody foreigner writing in English. Conrad went out of his way to present himself as an English gentleman. For instance, recalling his visit to Conrad at home, the American writer and critic James Huneker said, his shrug and play of hands are Gallic or Polish, and his eyes, shiny or clouded, are not of our race. In a word, he's more foreign looking than I expected. And then he continues, yet he astonished me later in the afternoon by suddenly transforming himself into an Englishman. He sported a monocle. His expression was almost haughty as he drove me in his car over the smooth Kentish roads. The Slav had disappeared. <laughs> Conrad's circle of friends provides a measure of his insider-outsider status. They include such anti-establishment figures as Edward and Constance Garnet, and Cunningham Graham, the pioneer socialist and Scottish nationalist but also embraced such establishment figures as Sir Sidney Colvin and Edmund Gosse. 
By the end of his life, he was the grand old man of English letters, and fated as such when he visited New York in 1923, the year before his death. He turned down honorary degrees from various universities, including Oxford and Cambridge. And in 1924, he also refused the offer of a knighthood from the Prime Minister, Ramsay MacDonald. Conrad's life and writing can be configured in terms of his sense of community. He spent nearly a quarter of his life as a sailor, and while crew life gave him a sense of stability and belonging, it also, as some critics have argued, encouraged a conservative attitude towards hierarchy and knowing one's place. His commitment to the collective, to the group, is everywhere. Examining Jim's dereliction of duty in Lord Jim, for instance, Marlowe declares the real significance of crime is in its being a breach of faith with the community of mankind. But as his flawed heroes demonstrate, Conrad's was not an idealized vision of humanity. And in later life, he would define the difference between himself and H.G. Wells as funda fundamental in these terms. He said, you don't care for humanity, but think they are to be improved. I love humanity, but I know they are not. There's something courageous in that, in that acceptance. I began by saying that nothing is quite what it seems with Conrad. And this is no less true of his sense of England and Englishness. Conrad, the international sailor, who traveled the world in the service of the British Merchant Marine, ended up living, as Virginia Woolf observed, in the depths of the country, out of earshot of gossips beyond reach of hostesses. The Conrads moved house frequently, occupying eight rented residences <coughs> in all, all in southern England, mainly in Kent. And he settled finally in the small, small Kentish village of Bishopsbourne, absorbed into English village life. The degree to which this absorption was complete is provided for us by another visitor to Conrad in the home Oswalds in Bishopsbourne in 1921. <coughs> Having gained an invitation to the Conrads, he got to Bishopsbourne, another American um, interviewer, and decided that rather than going straight to the house, he would ask the locals, he would ask the people in the village what they knew of the grand old man of English letters in their midst. Here is his account. Sighting a man in the field, I called to him. He knew there were two boys, one at work in London, the other playing at farming, and he pointed to the hillock behind which he went on, uh, behind which he went on to say was the farm. No, he couldn't say anything about their father. He's a writing man, was the sum of his knowledge. No, he had not read any of his writings. No one I approached in the village had read his writings. And I thought of the prophet who remained a stranger to those about him. On a bulletin board on the rear wall of the church, I saw his name, <coughs> among others, listed for parish duty of a sort. The sun had bleached the writing into invisibility almost. <coughs> There's perhaps something crucial about <coughs> blending in, becoming anonymous, becoming part of village life. But coexistent with this narrow, circumscribed <coughs> world is the wider world outside. At the end of a writing career that began with novels set in the colonial world, Conrad's late fiction returns to European settings, turns to an engagement with 19th century <coughs> European history for its frame of reference. In a letter of 1923, he wrote, I think that I'm not taking too much upon myself in saying that I'm a good European. Not exactly in the superficial, cosmopolitan sense, but in the blood and bones, as it were, and as the result of a long heredity. Because unlike his parents, Conrad was not nationalist. He was internationalist. Proud of being British and clearly committed to the life of England, he yet viewed Britain as part of a community, a community of nations. 
written in 1905, at the beginning of the 20th century, a century when the boundaries of nationality assumed ever greater significance, and when historical amnesia became a political weapon, Conrad's great essay, Autocracy and War, anticipates the European Union. In it, he calls for the solidarity of Europeanism, claiming that this solidarity must be the next step towards the advent of concord and justice, an advent that, however delayed by fatal worship of force and the errors of national selfishness, has been and remains the only possible goal of our progress. Conrad the Kentishman is simultaneously Conrad the European, truly homo duplex and amazing 